thank you and thanks for coming to my talk from ctf to cve and uh i'm going to talk about this uh, team we call charity case and a little bit about how i accidentally hacked a telematics app um, with a little bit of knowledge you too might find a vulnerability who am i i'm just some guy named will i uh, i lead a team we call ourselves charity case uh, i'm a ham operator and you're going to know when you meet a ham operator because i guarantee you within five minutes of meeting them they're going to tell you they're a ham operator it, it's it's kind of like an unwritten rule uh so my call sign is kilo mike six echo uniform victor uh, I am wearing a radio throughout DEF CON, so if you want to reach out and hit me up, I'll be on two-meter call line frequency. You can call my call sign. I'm also a CTF team lead for a few different years at DEF CON's Car Hacking Village. Um, in 2016, I won a little drone with uh, the help of one other person. In 2018, a group of people that I literally met at DEF CON, we all grouped up and uh, we won an ATV. 2019 won a tesla model 3 and that's a picture of it right there if uh if you were here you'll know that this car was beat up and by the time we left it had no hood um and that car also got drawn all over it's been great we've had a lot of fun with it we've donated and done a bunch of stuff for charity because of that car 2020 we won also a trip to 2021 defcon which we are doing in 2022 because of uh, the hybrid nature and our ohio folks not being able to come out this year i'm also a car hacker at least i like to claim i'm one uh, i've got a couple cves you can check out cve 2017-6052 and 2017-6054 both are for the telematics system we're going to be discussing today from a uh we're going to refer to them as a OEM for the rest of this talk. They did ask that I, I don't uh, name their actual name. There's also ICSA 17-11503, which this is a fun one for bar tricks and other stuff when people say something unique. Uh, or if someone says, are you on a list because you're a hacker? And I have to respond, I'm pretty sure I'm on a list, but not because I'm a hacker, but because there's a Homeland Security article that references one of my hacks. Uh, I used to be a car tuner, and I say used to be because I work InfoSec full-time, but for a brief part of my life, I worked full-time tuning cars. My office was a, a car, usually a Corvette, a Cadillac CTSV, a Camaro, one of those guys, something with an LS-powered motor, and uh, I made them go really fast. I worked on a six-second car. Um, I was the main log review guy for that car, and I did boost stuff. And then I had a bunch of other records I did all by myself, uh, such as on the Camaro and the Trailblazer SS. Um, and currently, I know I say I'm retired from tuning, but I still work on uh, the world's fastest Kia Stinger. And we're running 11s in that right now, uh, verified at the strip. One of the, one of the neat things about that car is it's being tuned in one of the more hack methods. I personally hack everything in my life. Like everything is a hack. I always like seeing the, how do I make something do what it's not supposed to do in a weird way? And when we tune that Kia, that's exactly what we do. We're using piggybacks and we're lying to the sensors and sh shifting voltages to make the car think it's doing one thing when in reality it's doing another. Um, really fun stuff. Uh, the car tuning is what really gave me my first understanding of how CAN bus worked and OBD and what systems did inside the car. I'm also really big in the self-driving stuff. Uh, I drive a Tesla, not the one you see in this picture, but a different Tesla. Um, I love FSD, though I think Elon's a little bit too aggressive with some of his stuff. Uh, level 5 isn't going to be here anytime soon. Um, I also worked on Kama AI projects. So the first one I did is I was an alpha tester on the Kia Stinger stuff, which meant I had to build a harness with just wires and a soldering iron, and I had to reverse the CAN bus messages to figure out certain things like steering angle degrees and things like that. And we learned things. For example, the steering angles are different on an all-wheel drive versus a rear-wheel drive. So the first time I loaded the software, the car felt like it was drunk, where the other person's settings worked perfectly fine for him. We figured out what that was with some CAN bus knowledge and uh, we're able to fix that. I'm currently working on um, my wife's Explorer ST. She would love to have Kama AI because she loved it in the Kia. 
So we're, we're, we're going down that path right now, seeing what we can do there. There's uh, some issues we ran into, but apparently a guy has a hack. And when I hear a guy has a hack, I'm always on board. Um, I also did something else that's uh, kind of unique. Apparently, I, I didn't. I considered it a Python script that just scored things and learned off of things. But uh, if you read the patent, they call it machine learning. Um, I, I worked on a patent for detecting bots inside of games based on certain components. Um, it, if you want to read more about it, it's called System and Method for Bot Detection. It was while I worked at the place that uh, is why I wasn't at DEF CON 2017. And that's a very important interlude too. Me being autistic and never remembering which way I'm doing something. Uh, I am on the spectrum. Um, I would be. I used to be classified as Asperger's, but in DSMB, uh, uh, DSMB, it's now autism spectrum disorder. And because I'm a high functioning person and have the savantness, uh, I like to speak for those who can't because I understand what the sensory uh, overload is and how it feels and you know what it does to you um so if you want to help out if you take a take a picture of that uh qr code right there you get the opportunity to donate via gofundme and it goes directly to autism speaks uh, i'm not taking anything from this um, i'm doing it 100 percent for charity so we got a word of warning there's a reason i wasn't at defcon in 2017 and that's because i found a cve um, and, and that may not sound like it makes sense, but here's what happened for me uh, and why I have this word of warning. I spoke to my work. I told him what I was working on. I told him I thought I found a vulnerability that could be a CVE. And this is before I ever tried to engage uh, the OEM. Um, my work was super supportive. My uh, my boss and my boss's boss were like, yeah, awesome, fine, good bug, you know, uh, there was like, you know, congratulations and things were great. They had one requirement and I stuck to the requirement, which was they did not want me to speak to the media. And I did not at all. Um, unfortunately, when you do a bug, find a bug like this and it's so widely seen and it has such a wide effect to things that people don't normally like think about or things that are easy to make uh, sensational. Um, it's going to get picked up by the news. Uh, my event was picked up by most of the major news articles, PC World, Tom's Hardware. It was super neat to see my name on those sites because these were all sites I've read for a long time. Uh, when that happened, the executives at the work were not happy at all. Um, very unhappy, to be honest. And they took um, actions against me because of this. One of the actions was a, a verbal dressing down, which I didn't enjoy. Uh, the next was they prevented me from going to DEF CON and told me if I did go, it would be bad for my career. Um, they were sure, even though I told them that I wasn't going to, they were sure I was going to give a big talk at DEF CON and whatever. And I, I didn't even have like, I hadn't even written a talk at this point. So they were just worried about nothing. Um, because of all this, when I got invited on to GMA, Good Morning America, I was not able to accept because I had agreed not to talk to the media. Even though they hadn't kept their side of the deal, I was keeping my side of the deal. So make sure if you're going to do this, make sure your employee's okay with it. Get it in writing. You know, I can't stress this enough. Before giving your talk, make sure the vendor's okay with it. Unless you don't care and you want to burn bridges, I personally don't want to burn bridges. I still have a great relation with my vendor. Uh, I still talk to them on a regular basis. I'm going to be meeting them for dinner actually here during DEF CON, I believe. Uh, the only reason their name isn't in there in here is because they asked me not to. And I uh, kept to that. And that way we have a great relationship if I decide to do any more research on their cars in the future. Only hack your own cars and items. There's a caveat to this. You're at DEF CON. You're in the car hacking village. There's all kinds of things around here to hack that you have permission to hack. Do that and responsibly disclose so this isn't the don't try this at home warning this is the cover your butt warning get it in writing make sure your vendor's okay and hack your own things it's it's inevitable when i tell somebody i run a car hacking team for charity they're like look at me crazy like cars can be hacked and they like point to some 90s car and 
you know, I look at it and go, yeah, cars can be hacked. Modern cars are basically a, a Alexa with wheels. They're IoT devices. They've got networks. Some of them are interconnected to the internet. I mean, they're, they're every bit is a hackable device as your laptop, Some in some ways more. Um, the next question is always, why would you hack a car? What's the point? And uh, this one's my favorite because to make it faster was always my response back in the day because that's what I did when I was hacking on cars. I was pulling the ROMs out and modifying the ignition tables and fuel tables and optimizing them for the parts to get optimal performance. Uh, you can also do things like enable hidden features. On Dodges, for example, you can enable SRT pages on cars that are not SRTs. You can add features. Let's say you got a BMW. They call it coding. You could do something like add a radar cruise system, and then you just code the ECU for it, and it works. Pretty neat stuff. Um, and last but not least is I like to hack things for the fun of it. I enjoy the chase. So I'm going to talk about the attack surface because I mentioned that attacking cars is uh, actually easier than a laptop because the attack surface is insane, and some of them they never really thought about security on. So let's start with the OBD port. The OBD2 port is where you can do data logging, you can check codes. Depending on the manufacturer and setup, you can flash modules, you can send CAN bus messages. It depends on the layout of the car. Every manufacturer has a slightly different setup. Um, you know, you'll have to look into your specific manufacturer. You can tap into the CAN bus at different points in the car. For Kama AI, we tapped into the CAN bus at the camera that was up by the mirror on the OEM car. USB ports. Now, I'm going to pick on Mazda or Mazda was genius. So either Mazda did this on purpose or they just sloppy. Uh, but you could basically put some scripts on a thumb drive and plug it into some of the Mazda telematics units and you could get root access and do things like load Android Auto. Um, so if they did it on purpose, thumbs up to you, Mazda. If you did it on accident, improve your security team. Uh, removing the ECU, this is what I spent years doing full time, uh, flashing the calibrations um, there, you know, not just performance things can be done, you can make them faster, but you could also do security implications. For example, you've got a new shiny car that has a transponder based key, and you have an ECU that expects that transponder based key, what if you just turn all those features off and make it so it'll start with any key. That's a thing you can do. Um, some manufacturers have been really sloppy and left root logins just laying there on serial ports. You just plug in some port to some ports on a motherboard. Voila. Here's one of my favorites. Uh, Charlie Miller's attack on Jeeps is super neat. Uh, that was an attack that took place over the internet because of an issue in the Uconnect systems. Uh, I encourage you to check out everything on that attack because it sounded like sci-fi the first time I heard it, but the infosec side of me was like, nah, dude, that's totally possible. All you'd have to do is root the first system, then write some pay. You know, I was tearing it apart in my head how they could have done it. Uh, it's super fun. Great read. And then today's less fancy, but still fun. Uh, considering I found this by accident is the attack on a telematics app. How did I get into car hacking? Well, it's DEF CON 2016. I'm walking around in the villages. I typically hung out in like the lock picking village and the tamper village previously because those were always neat to me. And this year I noticed something new, the car hacking village. So I come in the car hacking village. I'm a car tuner by hobby. I'm an infosec engineer by trade. And uh, after doing a couple questions, you, once you got a certain amount of points, you got a copy of the car hacker's handbook. Uh, during that DEF CON. And so I had a copy of the Car Hacker's Handbook. But still, what trends do I have? I knew from previous stuff that you need a team. Um, and I've never competed at a, at a level like this. You know, I, I've only done CTFs for fun at this point. And, you know, I've, I've done them at the office, you know, when we would hire a company to do it. But I had never done anything really hardcore yet. Still, I don't have a team. So I start hacking away, and there's there's super nice people that were encouraging me, and when I would get stuck, would you know give me hints or sometimes tell me like go check this chapter in the book and things like that, and it really kept me engaged. But I still was by myself, and I noticed another gentleman who had similar tools to me laying out. You know, I noticed the Tatrix cable and some things like that, and I'm like, this guy's a tuner. Well, I can talk tuner. Um, 
So normally autistic will that doesn't know how to talk to anybody has the opportunity to now talk to people because it's about a topic that I'm obsessed with, cars. I start talking to this gentleman. Yep, he's a tuner. He's a CISO for a company. Um, he's he's definitely in it. So we decide to name ourselves Acid Fingers, and we just start plugging away for fun. And uh, little did we realize until the last day that we were like in third place, and we had the opportunity to stay in third place. We actually were in second at one point, and we were close to first. And we you know we just didn't make it. But either way, there was great people there. We had a great time, and we still won our first third place win, which was the encouragement to continue doing this. So if you are trying to learn more about car hacking, check out this book. I encourage you to buy it on the No Starch Press, but there are there is a free copy available on his site, I believe. So why do we do it for charity? Um, really, the truth is, have you ever tried to cut an ATV into five equal pieces? You don't get a functional anything at the end. Uh, and this is what happened to us in 2018. We won the ATV with this team that we built on the fly at DEF CON. Uh, we were not for charity that year. Well, I was, but other people were doing whatever they wanted. Um, and we decided to go at it. We, we won, but we lost the title. We took second place that year. We got the ATV. We lost the title. And that meant we had to sell the ATV really cheap. Uh, I told myself never again. I'm not doing this. This is frustrating. So in 2019, we decided to go at it way more intentional. We decided to build a team with the right skills that we thought we needed to compete at a serious level. Um, we also made an agreement with the team that someone on the team would buy the car, and that would give us the money to donate to various charities. Uh, <clears throat> we ended up donating over $9,000 just to this school, which is why you see this picture here. We saved art. They were gonna cancel art programs at this local elementary, and it does happen to be my, uh, my daughter's elementary, but they were gonna kill art for the whole school. And we figured what, the, it's a local area, let's, let's go at it, let's do it. So we found out how much to save art, and we made a donation of $9,001, which was over 9,000, which was the goal and uh, saved art. And as part of it, we let children draw all over the Tesla. Kids got an absolute kick out of this. Like they blew their mind that they got to draw on a Tesla and it was all gonna stay on there. And it did, it's still on there to this day. 2020, we won again. Uh, that, that year we decided to go ahead and just see if we could take the toy drive that I've been running, which usually would make, you know, a thousand to $2,000 and see how crazy we could get it if we threw it in uh, our, our, our bound. So when we were all said and done, we raised over $7,000 for charity. We ended up donating tons and tons of toys. Uh, there's pictures on my Twitter and you'll see that at the end. Um, this year we're taking a break. We want to give other people a chance to, to really explore and we wanted to help out. So if you need help, we're helping people out with the CTF in exchange for charity donations. Let's talk about the timeline of CVE. And I, I got to quote Golden Girls here, you know, like uh, like the old grandma lady. <laughs> Picture it, California, 2016, the time before masks. I'm working at a uh, local company in the Bay. I'm leading a security gaming group. Basically, we did CTFs for fun. And what that entailed was I would do a CTF and then other folks from the company who were not on the security team would come and they would participate and do the CTF and they would use me as their knowledge base. So when they needed to do a man in the middle and they knew that they needed a man in the middle, but they didn't know how to use burp suite, I was that. So what I would do is practice all the CTFs at home in my spare time so I could always be up to speed on them. So an upcoming CTF I was going to do needed me to set up some man in the middle of an Android app, which is the setup for all this and how I discovered it. Um, I had recently purchased a 2017 plug-in hybrid uh, sedan with a really advanced telematics system. And I'm practicing and I discover a flaw. Then 2017, I spent a large amount of my time trying to talk to the vendor. Uh, initially, I ran into 
so much trouble trying to get a hold of anybody. I make a phone call, the help desk would tell me I was like silly and try to help me reset my username and password. I don't know how many times they offered to reset my password for me. Um, initially, I tried some emails I found online that didn't go anywhere. I went on LinkedIn, you know, I figured I could find somebody there. No one responded to me on there. What I learned is responsible disclosure is really hard, really, really hard. But later you'll find out how I solved that. Once, once I did get the event, the vendor engaged, they fixed the problem in three days. They didn't even tell me they had it fixed. I just actually opened my phone. That was an update for the app. And as soon as I pulled down the app, I noticed that all of that stuff that I'd previously found was gone. So what's the setup I was talking about? What, what led me to finding it? So I was doing man in the middle of an Android app. So what I would do is build a Linux for virtual machine with a USB Wi-Fi adapter in host AP mode, which basically means that my Linux box was acting like an access point. Then I would set up some IP tables rules to route all of the common non SSL web ports over to uh, burp suite. And I would set burp suite up and non intercept. And I can't remember if they call it passive mode or basically it can blindly receive do proxying for you. And I had it set up like that. So I'm, I'm in the middle, man in the middle here. I'm testing away on the app for the CTF. You know, I'm finding little bugs and I'm looking at Burp Suite and seeing what it does. And biology happens, you know, I'm hungry and I need caffeine. So close the app I'm working on, open up the application for my OEM car and tell it to start. Cool. Give the car a couple minutes, go outside, go to Wendy's, get me some dinner. Uh, I'm back enjoying my dinner, and I'm looking through the logs. I realize, what the heck? There's an HTTP request going to an IP address. Just one. Just one request like this. And every other request in Burp Suite was DNS. So it stuck out like a sore thumb. Here's the request I seen. Pretty quickly, I was able to look at this, and... Obviously, my OEM redacted uh, was the OEM's name. Um, the next thing I noticed was the 3.94 was the same version as the app on my phone. And at this point, I'm like, ooh, I think I found something strange. <clears throat> at the very least, the encryption looked weak to me. Now, I'm not a cryptography person, to be 100% clear. I am horrible cryptography. But I do know that like there's like the block style versus message style. And there's like, different ways you can do it. And it appeared that part of the data above was definitely being done the same way every time, which led me to believe that it might be breakable. So my next steps, I've got to figure out how do I replicate this web request? I need to make it happen, preferably happen at will. Next, I want to know about this IP address. What is it? Like, where is it? Who owns it? All that stuff. Last but not least, I want to understand the app better. And I had previously played with a tool called JADX. And uh, I knew I was going to use that tool for this. So let's start with replicating the request. This was giving me a lot of problems. I struggled. Um, I didn't know why it would happen. I knew that it would happen at least once per day. I figured that out over the course of a week. I also figured out by building my own uh, receiver tool that if I routed the web request to my, my Python script that took the web request, that I could make it download the file, but tell it it didn't finish. And it would cause the phone to do it every single time. So at this point, I knew that if the phone would open and try to upload the file and fail, that it would continue to try every single time it got on Wi-Fi. Um, I also knew that on occasion I was able to make it happen in certain error scenarios, but I, I, I could not reliably make a new one happen, like at will. So in other words, I'm stuck, I'm like really frustrated and time for more caffeine. So let's look at the IP. First, we try some Google dorking. Not much there. Duck, duck, go. Every search engine I can think of, I hit it. Um, nothing. Hit it with a browser basic web request. I looked at the burp suite logs to make my responder tool that we wrote in Python. 
Uh, I in map it. I want to give a word of caution here. Please only in map with the correct settings. Don't go at it with dash capital A or anything that could use uh, harmful NSE scripts. Still nothing. I knew basically that it was a piece of middleware receiving a thing. Nothing else interesting. What do I do? So JADX. What is JADX? JADX is a Java decompiler, and it does a really good job at most code I've thrown at it. it basically, you give it an APK, it spits out some code. Won't lie, I'm lazy. I didn't even download the tool and figure out the command lines. I used a website and just uploaded the APK file that I pulled off pure APK and uh, pulled it down the code. Why is this useful? Man, plain text code can tell you a whole bunch. What did, I, what did we find in this code? Well, the first thing I did was search for that IP since I knew that was unique. And that told me everything I needed to know at that point. Logs. It's basically a log handling system. So whenever the system has a log that needs uploaded, I learned from the code that once per day, it will upload the log when it gets on Wi-Fi the first time. Um, it will not do it unless it's on Wi-Fi. I learned what makes the log get written to. Basically, a, logging into the app, using the app, anything you could do in the app makes it right to the log. So if you use the app the next day, the first time it gets on Wi-Fi, it's going to upload it. Next, I want to know, what is this encryption? <laughs> Pretty awesome. Right near the code is the encryption key and the library name it uses, and the method. So literally we know everything we need to need at this point to write some Java code to decrypt the log. What's in that decrypted log? Oh my. At this point is when I'm giddy because I realized that this log that they're sending to a random IP on the internet, which wasn't random, I did learn it was one of their servers hosted somewhere random. Um, it's sending a username, a password, your VIN, your last location of the car, GPS coordinates, the address of the owner of the car, all the features the car has. You want to know if the car has heated seats? No problem. It's here. Color, make, and model. Everything you need at this point to take over the telematics app. So I don't even have to like get fancy and write cool web requests and anything and send them to a server. I can just launch the app on another Android device and log in with everything I have here to verify myself. Here's the payload. I've obviously censored certain things. It's not a big deal. I don't even have the car anymore. Uh, but as you can see here, my address is in there. It's down the block. Even more, the access token is here. The client ID, the client secret. Everything you might need to attack this in multiple ways but why go difficult when you could just load the app and literally log in as the user at that point now you might think oh you need to be on wi-fi blah 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 that makes this attack not very useful you would be wrong because if you go to any of the hyundai dealers that i looked at locally and a couple that i had a friend check in another state um they have all have open wi-fi all the dealers that that i looked at would have open wi-fi and they tell you to use it. So when you do your first registration of this app, it's going to uh, be on open Wi-Fi. Okay, that's not that dangerous, is it? Well, it is because in for fun and profit, I made a version of this in our, out of an access point running on a Raspberry Pi using fruity Wi-Fi that basically I used against myself that would capture the logs when the, when the user came by. So if the user were to be, if you were to put this near a dealer or anywhere else that you know, might be a user that would do it, malls, or if you're attacking a specific target, you could put it outside their house. They're just going to end up moseying onto that Wi-Fi using Karma. Now we're talking about a Wi-Fi pineapple, but I use fruity Wi-Fi instead. Uh, but they're going to use Karma and they're going to get caught on your, your, your attack network here and they're going to send their data. So it did have some danger, but at least it was isolated and had to be targeted. So let's talk about reporting the flaw. This proved more difficult than I really expected. It was so difficult. I was so frustrated. The help desk calls were really frustrated. When I tried to go Karen mode, oh, that went even worse. 
And I had managers do Comey. I was mistaken. They used much harsher words. Uh, I had managers hang up on me. I had managers tell me to stop wasting their time. I had one manager threaten me saying that he would report me if I kept calling in. I'm like, I want to speak to somebody. And I was documenting and I wasn't calling like back to back. I was calling like Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Um, what, it, what it goes to tell is being the good guy is really hard. So during 2016's DEF CON, I met some folks from Rapid7 who uh, were at the event. And uh, I'm super frustrated. I don't know what else to do. I ping my guys at Rapid7, and they they get back really quick. I'm like, yeah, we know people at that OEM. Let me uh, let me reach out. So they contacted the vendor. Three days later, after they they got engaged and and sent the first example of the payload decrypted, and I sent them their code and showed them where the flaw was. Um, they had it patched, and that was super cool. I thought that was neat. About a week later, they did an enforced patch, which they made all the old versions stop working. At this point, they engage with me one-on-one, -on -one and we talk a little bit back and forth, and they do some due diligence to confirm that it looked like no one else had done what I had figured out how to do, which was good. Uh, last but not least, the vendor, which wants to remain nameless, wants me to tell you that they added a vulnerability disclosure program. So I'm not quite sure why they wanted to make sure I include that in the talk when they don't want their name, but it's in there. Oh my God, a pop-up during the middle of a talk. Sorry, I can't be team charity case if I'm not hawking some charities, right? Um, and I like dinosaurs and so is my toddler. This is Donate Life. Donate Life is an amazing charity. They, uh, they help folks who are on like dialysis get kidneys and help with the funds or hearts, any organ and soft tissue. Donate Life is uh, the group that's out there helping out. They're really a great cause. Um, if you can drop some coin to them, do so. If you can't, you know, tell somebody else to do it. All right, after that brief interlude there, how can an OEM improve? Train your staff. I can't stress this enough. When I'm calling consistently and telling you that I have a problem that's that's serious, have your staff at least know how to escalate to infosec. If they don't know how to escalate for infosec because a guy is calling in and describing you know very advanced things to them, they also don't know how to escalate to infosec when they get a phishing email. So to make this clear, this is a, a thing that will help your whole business. Publish your public contacts for your IR and security team. Below, you'll see a method that's commonly accepted. Please, nothing existed. If I could have got a hold of somebody on the security team, this could have been solved in three days, not almost three months. Participate in bug bounty programs. I have personally uh, led bug bounty programs for places I've worked, and they've always been beneficial. Um, for us car hackers that are amateurs out here having fun, we love to look around and find bug bounty programs. Last but not least, participate in the car hacking village. And I'm going to pick on Tesla a little bit here just because I like picking on Elon's company. And I'm a fan. Um, don't be Tesla. In 2018, Tesla brought out a Tesla to look at. They also banned me from touching the Tesla when I started poking it and trying to make it join my Wi-Fi and do things. So if you're going to bring a car here, understand that people want to poke it and explore. So be a good vendor. There's been great partners. There's lots of great partners in this core that bring cars and even bring like Tesla ECUs and things to hack on. Take advantage of it. And if you're an OEM and you want to do it, it reach out to me. I can get you in contact with people or reach out to the Car Hacking Village Direct. Don't be afraid. We don't bite that much. All right. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. This picture here was a picture I wish I could have been there for, but I didn't expect to win in 19. I expected us to do a good job. But so my plane flight was back. I was, I was already on the airplane at this point. And pictured here is Wilson. 
who is uh, we were we were super excited to have on our team. He actually competes on the RPI main DEFCON CTF. That year they ended up not qualifying, so we got to steal him. In the back is Eason. He's super cool. He drives this car around, and it looks not like that. The hood's different now with all the writing on it instead, because that hood wouldn't stay closed. We had to take it off. Uh, and the other gentleman here, Southern. Him and I, we met at this DEF CON, and he's competed with me every time since. He's here at the event with me. Uh, we have became really good friends, and we're even building a 24 Hours of Lemons car under the charity case name. Uh, so if you want to find out about that, you can follow me on Twitter or on YouTube. Most of my stuff on YouTube is about tuning, but it's car-related. And uh, check out these links. Again, Hawk and my donations. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Have one last tip. If you have a Tesla with no hood and it's a low battery, it only gets 140 miles. If you put a cardboard hood on it, you get over 160 miles. That's your hack for the day. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed DEF CON, and thanks so much for coming to my talk.